Thanks again for having me. Let me just share my slides. All right, so I did I did uh, tease folks yesterday with the, the prospect of me giving some up-to-date results that pulsar terminal arrays have. Um, and so that'll be a, th this talk will basically be a summary of uh, recent results, I would say within the last year, and then where we're going in the near future. So to give you an idea where this field is headed. So first of all, I wanted to lay out a detection timeline. Um, so this is uh, an often, often question that's asked, when will pulsar time arrays detect gravitational waves? Well, the answer has, has, uh, has multiple parts because um, there, is, there is a sequence of milestones that we, that we will hit along the way to detection and then after detection. Um, when people ask what will we detect and when will we detect it, um, the first answer is usually that we expect to detect a stochastic gravitational wave background coming from the aggregate signal from lots and lots of different supermassive black hole binaries emitting together. Now, all of those binaries emitting together can't be all individually resolved. Um, and so they pile up within a given frequency resolution bin of our detector and they form a stochastic signal. So just using the central limit theorem, all of these signals piling up together um, create what we expect is a Gaussian stationary stochastic background that we, we attempted to find by probing its statistical properties and uh, using that Hellings and Downs curve that we talked about yesterday as the unique fingerprint of detection in our pulsar, pulsar array. So we expect this is going to happen within the next few years. Um, and where previously that was based on projections from upper limits, now it's based on something a little bit more solid in that uh, we actually start, have started to see something uh, that we think could be uh, the first signs of a stochastic background. Um, once we get that stochastic background um, and make the detection of that Hellings and Downs curve, uh, we'll start to move on to the kind of science that can you know, emanate from that background. And that will be whether we can prove the merger rate determining factors that are in the amplitude of the spectrum of the background. Um, the shape of the spectrum itself also encodes a lot of astrophysics, including the sort of detailed recipe of dynamical processes that affect supermassive black hole binaries on their way from evolving from wide separations to small separations. So it's, it's quite easy for astrophysical processes in the merger remnant of a galaxy to, to get the black holes to within about a parsec of each other. You can just get that through kind of a viscous drag influence, a dynamical drag influence. Um, but at a parsec, there, there start to be other processes that take over and those other processes that drive the system very closely together include interactions of stars that scatter off of the binary. Uh, so lots and lots of stars that scatter off the binary can carry energy away from the binary orbit and you get a shrinking of that orbit. Um, also at lower separations, you can have interaction of the, the, the black holes with a circumbinary disk and the binary will torque the disk of gas and, um, and that will eventually lead to energy dissipation from the orbit. And again, that causes the black holes to get smaller uh, and smaller separated. Finally, at around a milliparsec separation, uh, you start to get gravitational wave emission dominating the, the orbital evolution of the system. And that is what gives the very characteristic power law spectral shape that we expect at higher frequencies. So, that was, uh, that was a long journey to get to the kind of astrophysics of the stochastic background, but it's not just the stochastic background we want to probe, it's individual sources that we want to probe as well. So eventually the resolution of our detector will, will get good enough and our, our uh, sensitivity will be good enough to start seeing individual binaries start to resign above the level of the background. So they'll start to just stick above the level of the background and, you know, beat uh, their other partners in the same bin uh, to, in order to be found as a single source. So eventually you'll have binaries that are nearby enough or massive enough in the population to start being seen as individual sources. Um, and we expect that will come towards the end of the decade. It's something that we expect will happen after the background detection um, because th these individual binaries, they have to fight against the stochastic background as a noise source 
um, like I said, they're, they're fighting against the rest of their partners in the same frequency resolution band in order to be seen. So it's something that will happen towards the end of this decade. And the number that could be found by the end of this decade varies by maybe an order of magnitude, <clears throat> an order of magnitude between a few and uh, 10. So that's the road ahead, very briefly. Um, and up until recently, the upper limits from PTAs looked like this. And it was a nice, steadily decreasing um, upper limit as a function of time. So the first millisecond pulsar was, was discovered in the early 1980s. And ever since that time, people have been started, uh, starting to try to limit the influence of gravitational waves on the timing properties of these pulsars. Um, this band of, of colored regions here show a broad region of predicted binary supermassive black hole background amplitudes. Um, so it's quite broad. And you know, if you tweak one factor in the calculation, you can change it. You can change this prediction by a, by a few. But this is correct to within, um, it, it spans maybe two orders of magnitude here. Um, and we're getting closer and closer to, to the prediction as time goes on. So these upper limits seem to drop quite precipitously early on and then sort of reach a plateau. And then in the early 2010s, they start to decrease again. How many MSPs do we know to date? Um, we, know, we know quite a few actually. Um, we're on the level of, I think we're on the level of hundreds, if not more of millisecond pulsars. Nanograph times 75 millisecond pulsars. Our other PTA partners time their own individual pulsars. When we combine all our data sets together, we'll get to we'll get to 100 plus pulsars. They have to be. It's it's not just millisecond pulsars. They have to be stable millisecond pulsars, and they have to have been timed long enough in order to make an impact in our detection strategies. So we typically require them to be observed for longer than three years, in order to make it into our in our into our data sets. So let me just explain some of these um, features in this upper limit um, drop over time. Um, so the, the drop over time is, is related to the fact that more pulsars have been added over time. But the, the statistical techniques did not really improve until we get to the 2010s. The 2010s is when it uh, first started to be possible to deploy sophisticated Bayesian techniques um, on our data sets. Um, and, and to fit the pulsar timing models and ind individual noise properties at the same time as the search for the gravitational wave signals. And so you get this remarkable increase in sensitivity down to what appears to be a recent floor, uh, very close to the predicted binary supermassive black hole background amplitude. And uh, nothing seems to have shifted really in the last couple of years. We're still, we were still placing upper limits until 2018. This last upper limit here, is a, is a limit study that I led for Nanograv in 11 years of its data. But Nanograv has regular um, data releases. It's committed to releasing data on roughly a one and a half to two year time scale. Um, so obviously the next data set after the 11 year data set would be the 12.5 year data set. And that was not an upper limit. So that was, something that seemed to have well-constrained uh, uncertainty regions on the amplitude of this signal that we're searching for. Um, I'll get into more details later. We didn't find the evidence for the very distinctive cross correlations that we need in order to claim gravitational waves, but we found um, a very well-constrained amplitude of some sort of spectrally common signal amongst our pulsars. Um, and what, what, what that actually is, will be seen in the future. We just need to collect more data. Uh, soon after this, um, the PPTA launched their own search and they found what appears to be um, another uh, signal that, that has uh, similar properties to the one that Nanograph found. Um, so that was an independent cross check of what we found. And so things are looking really good at the moment. The EPTA and the IPTA here are just uh, faded out a little bit. Um, that just means that their searches are coming really, really soon. Uh, we expect that you'll see papers from the EPTA and the IPTA with broadly consistent results to Nanograv and the PPTA within the next few months. Okay, I see there's an, okay, good. <clears throat> 
So what did we actually find in this nanograph 12.5 year search? Um, well, it generated a lot of excitement. It was a search for an isotropic stochastic gravitational wave background. Uh, it was put up on archive uh, in September, 2020. And since that time, it's had 181 citations. Uh, you'll find it in the Astrophysical Journal letters. And uh, the lead author was one of my colleagues in Nanograv, uh, Joseph Simon, uh, who was at JPL, um, but is now at CU Boulder. All right, so this is what we found. What we found is um, an excess noise process that has low frequency structure in our timing data. And that low frequency structure has a spectrum that appears to be common across many of the pulsars in our array. Um, not only that, but the spectrum that it has is broadly consistent with expectations of a supermassive binary black hole background. So it, it has a slope and amplitude that's broadly consistent with expected models. On the left-hand side here, I'm showing you um, one of the plots from the paper, and it's essentially showing you the, the spectrum of the timing deviations that are found in the data set. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, we can probe down to frequencies corresponding to one over the total observation time of the array. So one over 12.5 years is roughly two nanohertz. And that's why this first gray point here is at around, is at around two nanohertz. Now these gray regions are, you can think of these like periodograms or just a spectrum that you're measuring, except in, instead of actually having error bars on the spectral measurements, these are Bayesian periodograms. So each of these is a Bayesian posterior probability distribution um, that has been represented on the plot here. So this, this kind of violin region is showing the probabilistic support of power in the timing deviations um, at each value of that power. So you see it has to it has a peak and then it goes down again. Um, some of these over here don't seem to have any support at high values. They just kind of go down and are consistent with the lower prior range they're being searched at. So these gray regions are, uh, you can think of these as Bayesian spectra um, that have been measured in individual frequency searches. So we search over each frequency's power uh, um, as an independent variable. Now, another search that we do is we search for power law strain spectral shapes. Um, and depending on the number of frequencies that we use in the power law representation, um, we get different answers. So if we search for 30 frequencies in our power law, so we're just representing some sort of strain spectrum of the background with, the, with 30 frequencies going from one over the observation time up to 30 over the observation time, we seem to get something that looks quite shallow. So that's that green dashed line right here. If we search for a smaller number of frequencies, say five frequencies, then that appears to tilt it to be more steep. So what this is telling us here is that there is some excess white noise contamination happening at higher frequencies here that is tilting a 30 frequency power law to be shallower than a five frequency power law. Now, if we let the data tell us the number of frequencies to use, um, then we get something that's closer to a five frequency power law. So if we use this blue line here, that's a broken power law. Um, the corresponding behavior is that we have a power law at low frequency and then it tilts to be flat at higher frequencies. And the transition point between power law and flat is chosen by the data. It's a variable that's searched over at the same time as everything else. And the data wants this to be close to five or six frequencies. Okay, so this is an adaptive way of judging the number of frequencies to include in a power law search at low frequencies. Now, this might seem like it's um, a little bit disconcerting that we have this contamination of, of the, the results at higher frequencies. Um, the good thing is that we don't expect a gravitational wave background signal to be strong at those higher frequencies anyway. So this is, this, this blue, these blue and orange lines here have the steepness expected of a supermassive black hole binary background um, in pulsar timing data. And so if we projected those to higher frequencies, it gets very, very weak at, uh, at the frequencies where we get contamination. 
So we don't actually collect a lot of information from those high frequencies. And so we're quite secure in just using the lowest number of frequencies to make our inferences. So can I ask why there is this uh, contamination? Is it just from the analysis or just uh, the noisy models or the timing models? Yeah, we think there, there could be a number of possibilities. Um, we think that there, there could be unmodeled white noise in the pulsar time series at higher frequencies. Um, it could also be the fact that we're, we're using the same noise modeling strategy for all of the pulsars. So all of the pulsars have a very boilerplate standard noise model. When really we should be treating, treating every single pulsar as its own sort of special snowflake Every pulsar is special and has its own description of noise processes. And so there should be an adaptive way of finding noise in all of the pulsars. Um, for example, if you look at a, a pulsar on a different side of the sky, then you're looking through an entirely different column density of electrons. And so the dispersive properties that the radio pulses experience will be unique compared to another pulsar. That's something that we haven't really taken into account here, uh, but it's an active, piece of analysis that's going on in Nanograv and indeed in lots of other, in, in the PPTA and the EPTA as well. So we think that could be a reason. Um, I, I should note as well that the PPTA has done their own analysis that I'll talk about later and they don't seem to see this contamination. So it could just be a property of data sets as well on the way we process things. It's not astrophysical anyway, we don't think it's astrophysical. Did All right, so moving on to the, oh, go ahead. I was just curious, did you say what the slope of the orange parallel was? I did not. Um, that slope is, it's close to, in this space, minus five. So it, it goes as F to the minus five. The, the actual power law for a binary supermassive black hole background would be F to the minus 4.33. Yeah. So it's really steep. Okay, so that was the spectrum on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I'm just showing you the posterior probability distribution of the amplitude of the signal that we recover. Um, now you'll see two types of curves in here. One of them has fixed SSE, the other has base FM. Fixed SSE and base FM correspond to different choices about um, how we model solar system ephemeris systematics. Um, now, this is, an important, this is an important thing that we found in, in our previous data sets analysis. We were seeming to get spurious uh, results depending on whether uh, we used one version of JPL solar system model versus another model that they'd issued. So P JPL periodically updates its models of the positions and the masses of solar system bodies. Now, this doesn't seem that important for what we're trying to do, but it's actually very relevant because those masses and positions of solar system bodies will affect where we calculate the solar system barycenter to be. It's just, that's just the center of mass of the solar system. And if you slightly tweak the positions of, of Jupiter and its mass, then you're going to shift the position of the barycenter. The barycenter is not the center of the sun. It's actually close to the surface of the sun. Um, and so a small change in that can affect a big change in how we reference our timing observations back to that position. That position of the barycenter is our quasi-inertial reference frame that all of our timing observations are, are centered to. Um, so if we use a bad model of the solar system barycenter, we're going to get systematic, um, spurious systematic um, noise in our, in our inferences about the stochastic background. So we shielded ourselves from that by developing our own Bayesian model of the solar system ephemeris, the solar system model. The way we've done that is we take a baseline model of the solar system given by JPL, or also in this case by INPOP, um, which is um, the, um, the, the French ephemeris. Um, it's developed by the, the French team. And um, we take a baseline model, and then we just perturb the trajectory of Jupiter or the trajectory of other gas giants that are most important. Um, and we also perturb the masses of planets and we constrain all of those parameters simultaneously with gravitational wave parameters and other noise parameters in our search. 
So the solar system becomes just another component of our giant global model that we search over when we do our gravitational wave analysis. It adds um, about a 10 extra parameters that we have to search over. And the result is that we do lose a little bit of significance in the measurement of this, of this signal, but not significantly. We still have a well-constrained amplitude posterior distribution um, with this Bayes FM analysis compared to if we just used one of the fixed solar system models given by um, JPL or NPOP. Now, under all of these different considerations and all of these different modeling approaches, um, the amplitude does clearly does not change that much. And the, the amplitude that we quote in the paper um, is, is the median of these posterior distributions. And it corresponds to about 1.9 times 10 to the minus 15. Important thing to note is that's the, that's the characteristic strain amplitude reference to a frequency of one over a year. You'll find that most pulsar timing results are referenced to a frequency of one over a year. It's just a field standard. Um, it's actually a really poor choice of reference frequency because pulsar timing arrays have almost no sensitivity at that frequency. Um, and I, I talked about this yesterday. That's the big spike in the sensitivity curve because we fit, have to fit the pulsar's position. And so that's a big notch in our sensitivity curve that removes our sensitivity there. Nevertheless, it's uh, for historical precedent reasons, we reference all of our sensitivity to, um, to a frequency of one over a year, which corresponds to about 32 nanohertz. Now this amplitude here um, at that frequency, it's actually on the high side of astrophysical predictions of the background from supermassive binary black holes. Um, it's not excluded and it's not in, in great tension, but it is larger than we expected it to be. Um, and so this has got some of our astrophysical colleagues interested in interpreting what that means about the, the supermassive black hole population. Was there evidence that uh, bias, taking into account uh, more parameters with bias can improve actually uh, the, the fit or uh, we just fix the SSD, we have less parameters and then like in terms of base factors, yeah. So in terms of base factors, the base FM definitely causes a reduction at the base factor in the measurement of the signal. And you can you can see this visually by the fact that um, the, the dashed curves here, the dashed posterior distributions, they have more probabilistic support at lower amplitudes, slightly lower amplitudes, which means that um, it's more consistent with zero than the fixed curve, but it's still nowhere near consistent with zero at all in, a, in absolute terms, because this is a very well-constrained amplitude. Um, so base FM does cause a reduction in significance, but it, but it solves an important problem of bridging systematic sources of errors. And we find this, we, we showed this in Nanograv's 11 year analysis that it, um, it causes kind of a bridging of otherwise systematically disparate results. And we also had a dedicated paper on it led by Michaela Valisneri that, uh, that shows that BASFM solves these problems of, of um, getting rid of systematic sources of uncertainty. Okay. Right, so just moving into more of the details of the analysis now, um, we do, several cross checks, cross validation checks to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves here. And one, uh, one of these cross checks was developed by my colleague um, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, Sarah Vigeland, and this is called the dropout factor. Um, the dropout factor, you can essentially think of that as the leave one out cross validation probability. But what it's measuring is at each of these pulsar positions here along the X axis, the number that's given for its dropout factor is a probabilistic measurement of how much that pulsar supports the signal that is found by the other n minus one pulsars. So clearly there, there are about 10 to 15 pulsars that have strong probabilistic support because they have dropout factors greater than one for what is found by the rest of the array. You can see that from the green and the blue uh, dots here. 
Now there are a lot of pulsars that simply don't care about this pulse uh, about this process about this signal because they have dropout factors of one, which means that they're completely ambivalent to the presence of this signal. Um, the reason why they're ambivalent is because either they don't have long enough timing properties to probe down into the relevant frequency range, or they have noise that makes it difficult for them to arbitrate on this process in the first place. So either they're too noisy or they don't have enough data in order to get into the right frequency range. To calibrate your understanding of what the right frequency range is, if you have three years of timing data, you can probe down to about 10 nanohertz. And we need it to be probing lower than 10 nanohertz. Most of the signal is between two and 10 nanohertz. So the, the small pulsars, the low baseline pulsars are not really informative. And then we have some pulsars that are interesting over on the right-hand side here. Uh, these pulsars actually seem to disagree with what is found by the other pulsars in the array. Now it's only a few, and as you can imagine, these pulsars are ones that we've, we've uh, set aside to look at with more dedicated noise modeling, more advanced noise modeling approaches, because we think that is, um, that is what the, the effect that's being seen here. That these pulsars have not been modeled well enough in their uh, low frequency noise properties in order to give positive support for this, uh, for this signal. But it's only a few pulsars, whereas a large number of pulsars over on the left-hand side here do have good support for the signal. So that's one of our cross-validation checks that we've done to make sure that this is not just being seen in one pulsar, it's being seen in lots of pulsars. Okay, now measuring this low frequency signal is great, but it's not, it's not actually what we want to do to, to claim detection of gravitational waves. In order to claim detection of gravitational waves, we need to measure the distinctive quadrupolar shaped Hellings and Downs curve um, in, the, in the correlated timing data between our pulsars. So that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing various reconstructions of the pairwise cross correlations in the timing deviations between different pulsars. So along the x-axis here, you've got the angular separation between the pulsars. Uh, on the y-axis, you're seeing various measurements of the cross-correlation factor between the pairs of pulsars. And you're not actually seeing the raw pairwise correlation data in here because with 45 pulsars, we actually have 990 distinct pairs. And so if I showed all of these on the same diagram, it would look very, very messy indeed. So we've just produced a binned analysis for, for ease of viewing. It doesn't affect the significance of, of our results. It's just aesthetically, we've chosen to show this in a binned way. Um, so first of all, in the top left here, you're seeing the results from the nanograph 11 year analysis from a few years ago. And this is showing correlation structure that's kind of all over the place. Um, it's difficult to actually infer anything from this. You've got points that are up and points that are down. Nothing seems to strongly agree with the blue dashed curve, which is what we're looking for. It's the Hellings and Downs curve. For reference, what is also shown here is the orange dashed curve. It's, it's a monopole. A monopole correlation signature is just flat at all angular separations. It's the same uh, signal in all of the pulsars, identically the same signal, including the same re realization of a stochastic process. Um, what that could be would be some sort of systematic uncertainty in clock referencing standards. All of our pulsars have to be referenced to a global time standard. And if there's some sort of long time scale systematic drift in the stability of the global time standard, then all of our pulsars would share that. So we have to accommodate that that could be a source of uncertainty. Um, so in all of this, we're trying to filter out the, the kind of monopole structure and just look at the, the blue Hellington, Hellington Dine structure. Andrew, go ahead. What clocks do you use on Earth to do this timing? Like what type of clocks? Yeah, so each observatory has its own um, clock standard. Um, they, they usually have some sort of maser clock that uh, they reference all of their observations to. Then the, the observatory clock standard has to be referenced to a national time standard. So each country has its own national time standard reference to a sequence of atomic clocks. 
And then all of those national time standards are averaged together to get a global time standard. Um, and there are other factors um, taken into account there, but, um, but it's a sequence of averaging to get the best result over many, many different national time standards and observatory time standards. In fact, at one point, um, at one point in history, I don't think it's true anymore, but maybe in the late 90s and early 2000s, pulsar timing used to be more accurate than the best atomic clocks on Earth. Um, so they more, were more stable, they were more reliable to just time pulsars. Um, that's not true anymore, but there are still people that are interested in building a pulsar-based time scale. And in fact, the International Pulsar Timing Array had a paper out about that a few years ago. Uh, the lead author was George Hobbs, if you're interested. So moving from the Nanograv 11 year data set down to the 12 and a half year data set, that's moving from this top left to, top, to bottom left box. You can see that some things have shifted. Um, the uncertainties are smaller. So we get tighter constraints. And also the points have started to orient themselves a little bit more closely to this Hellings and Downs curve. Now the significance here is nothing to report about. It's, it's, the, the signal to noise is very, very low. Um, it's, it's only at the level of between one and two. So this is not something that, that we report about, but it's a positive sign that it's getting closer. In the top right here, you're showing, you're seeing an analysis that I did. It's a Bayesian recovery of these cross correlation signatures. So on the left-hand side, this was a frequentist maximum likelihood estimator of the, the pairwise correlations. On the right-hand side, you're seeing a Bayesian recovery of the cross correlation signatures. And this is using techniques from a, a paper that I wrote with Jonathan Gare and Lidley Lantati um, many years ago now. Um, the points here are, again, Bayesian um, violin posterior distributions. Um, so they're showing probabilistic support at each um, angular separation. And so what we've done here is we've just created a parameter that uh, corresponds to the angular correlation signature at each angular separation. And then there's a, a spline interpolant that smoothly connects <clears throat> these different pulsar angular separations. Um, and what you're seeing here is sort of the recovery of what you get at different angular separations. The reason why we have such a broad uncertainty in this last angular separation bin is because we don't have many pairs there. Um, in fact, <clears throat> If you, if you had um, pulsars spread uniformly on the sky, then the distribution of angular separations goes as sign of the angular separation. What that means is that there are very, very few pulsar pairs at small angular separations. And there are very, very small, and very, very few pulsar pairs at large angular separations at 180 degree angular separations. Um, what's interesting here as well is that the, the pairs seem to be slightly offset from the Hellings and Downs curve, suggesting that there, there, there could be an additional process in here that's um, being conflated with a possible gravitational wave signal. So it looks like we've taken the Hellings and Downs curve and slightly offset it, added a little bit to it. Um, this is ongoing work that's being looked at to see whether there are actually multiple signals at the same time happening here. But the, the point of all of this is that the, the cross correlations in the 12.5 year data set are very, very weak. The odds ratios, the Bayesian odds ratios are only about two to four, uh, depending on the type of ephemeris modeling we use. Steve, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just had a question with the, you showed this dropout factor and there are a number yep. of dropout factors that you thought possibly need some more careful modeling. If you remove those from the analysis you just showed us, is there an improvement or is it, is it not, not, not much happens when you do that? Yeah, actually not much happens when you do that. Um, because, these, because these pulsars are in such disagreement with the other N minus one pulsars, if you remove them, it doesn't change the parameter estimation that much because they're already in conflict with, with uh, the rest of the array. So if you remove them, it might slightly increase the significance of the measurement of this process, um, but it doesn't change the parameter estimation that much. And it certainly doesn't affect the, the significance of cross correlations. Okay. 
All right. So one um, one other thing I wanted to mention was how we measure the significance of these cross correlations. Obviously, we can do that with with phase factors and Bayesian odds ratios, but um, it's usually quite difficult if you've if you've done any Bayesian inference. You know, it's quite difficult to interpret what phase factors actually mean. Technically, they're they're actually probabilistic odds that you can quote. So, depending on how you feel about gambling. If you got a hundred to one or a thousand to one odds in favor of something, that's that's good support, and you would bet on that. Um, but we'd like to calibrate that for our particular problem, and a way we can do that is using something we call sky scrambles and, and phase shifts. Um, they're essentially the PTA version of LIGO's time slides, uh, LIGO Virgo time slides. I don't know if that's been discussed earlier in the week, uh, whether Jonah mentioned that, but. LIGO and Virgo have ways of, of sliding their data and offsetting that um, by, by different amounts of time to see how often spurious noise fluctuations can give signals that are as significant as what has actually been found. The way we do this is that we add random phases to different representations of the signal in our pulsars, or we scramble the pulsar positions on the sky. And that means we're getting rid of any real correlations, uh, cross correlations in our data set. So we're essentially trying to scramble the presence of any type of cross correlations in our data. And then the base factor we measure is, is a representation of how often spurious noise fluctuations can conspire to create significant cross correlations. Um, specifically, significant cross correlations that have a Hellings and Down shape. So these orange and green histograms here are the null distribution of cross correlations. Um, so they're, they're the distribution of base factors we would measure if there were just noise in our data set. And we were getting noise, correlating with noise and occasionally producing something that maybe looks like the Hellings and Downs curve with different levels of significance. Um, so this is a way for us to judge the actual significance um, of our measured Bayes factor. It's a sort of an unholy union of frequentist and Bayesian techniques, but it's a way for us to calibrate the, the scale of interpretation of our Bayes factors. And what we're seeing at the moment is that the measured Bayes factor of cross correlations in the 12.5 year data set um, uh, is, is very, very weak. We have a p-value, which is just the integral from the blue line to higher values of about five to 10%. So that's certainly nothing to write home about. We need to get uh, to, to sub percent and hopefully 0.1% um, p-values in the future in order to claim significance. Um, and I should mention as well that Lorenzo in the audience um, is looking at ways of improving our, our coverage of pulsars in the sky in order to better discriminate the Hellings and Downs curve versus other types of cross correlation signatures. So that's related to the strategy for finding the optimal pulsar time and array geometry. Yeah. All right, so I've talked a lot about nanograph data, but I want to talk about Park's pulsar time and array data. And I thought I heard someone maybe want to ask a question as well. Yes, um, just to, to clarify, so this is, uh, is it correct to say that with the data analysis that is you have done right now, that it's the odds that it is actually the gravitational wave background is one in 10 to understand your, your plots that you have just uh, shown, more or less? Um, so so not, not quite. The interpretation is that we can, we can reject the, um, we can reject the null hypothesis of no correlations um, with a with a p value of about five to ten percent. Now that's not that's not great, um, but it's it's also not um, insignificant either. In fact, we do have some probabilistic support for gravitational wave correlations, but it's very very weak. So the Bayesian odds are only about two to four to one in favor of these Hellings and Downs correlations. Now, by contrast, we can actually reject other types of correlation signatures. The data is very informative of monopole and dipole correlations. And we reject the, the dipole correlations to quite a strong degree. But we don't have a lot of support 
for hellions of dynes correlations yet. The good thing is that the support at the moment is greater than one, but we would like it to be more like 100 or even a thousand in order to finally claim detection. Thanks. So the Parks Pulsar Time and Array in Australia has measured something very, very similar, which is, which is exciting. Um, this is an independent cross-check. They have a completely separate data set um, of pulsars that they've analyzed. And their results are broadly consistent with what Nanograv has found. They found a very steep, low frequency, spectrally common process in its array of pulsars. They don't seem to suffer from the same high frequency contamination. So in fact, their, their uh, recovered posterior probability distributions look a lot more constrained and, and, and tighter. And uh, they've done a series of other cross checks that show good support for, um, for this process. They also don't have uh, any evidence of the cross correlation yet. But this is all expected. Um, you know, the pulsar timing arrays are a very low frequency experiment, which means that the milestones are spread out in time and significance grows slowly. And the exciting thing is that we've already collected about 15 years of data. So all of that weighting is mostly done. And now we're at the stage where we've measured the first signs, which is in the spectrum, we've measured a strong excess low frequency spectral process. And then very, very soon we expect to be able to say one way or the other, whether this has Hellings and Downs correlations or not. And we should be able to say with our most recent sets of data. Nanograv is already finalizing its 15 year data set, um, which is an extension of two and a half to three years beyond what I'm reporting about here. And uh, that not only adds additional data to the pulsars that were timed in the previous data set, but it also adds about 20 new pulsars which helps a lot with the significance of cross correlations because you can make many more pairs between the pulsars. So things look really exciting. And um, I, I hope to be able to tell some of you in the next year what we actually find um, one way or the other. So the EPTA results, the European Pulsar Timing Re Array results are coming very, very soon. Um, I've seen a, a draft of, of the paper and uh, hopefully the, the rest of the world will see it in the next uh, month or two. Likewise, for the International Pulsar Timing Array uh, analysis, which is the fusing of data sets from, from all of the individual PTAs, that analysis um, has been done, and I hope you'll be able to see that within the next few months. Uh, I don't think it's spoiling anything to say that the results will, you see will be broadly consistent with, with what Nanograv and the PPTA have reported about at the moment. That's all great news because they're, they're all independent cross checks. Speaking of the IPTA, the most recent data set that's been analyzed is actually, um, unfortunately, the most recent data is actually obsolete by now. It takes a long time to put these data sets together and to harmonize the different data sets from the different pulsar timing arrays. So in the IPTA data release two, which came out a few years ago, um, we have EPTA data, which stretches from 1996 to 2015. We have the Nanograv nine-year data set. So remember, we're, we're now working with 12.5 and 15-year data sets. We've got the Nanograv nine-year data set here, which stretches from 2004 to 2013. And then the Parks Pulsar Timing Array data, data release one, which goes from 2005 to 2011. There are 65 unique millisecond pulsars in there. Uh, some of them actually have observation times in excess of 20 years. That doesn't mean that they have coverage over 20 years solidly. Some of these pulsars have a few observations back in the 90s and then a long gap, and then they're starting to be observed again. So um, roughly the effective time span of this array will be 15 to 20 years. Um, and this is a lot of pulsars, a lot of pairs, um, and spread quite nicely uniformly across the sky. The results are, look, are looking very good, they're coming soon. Um, we're seeing consistent results from these, from these data sets with, um, with what has been reported by Nanograv's 12.5 year analysis, the PPTA analysis, and what is being seen in the EPTA as well. So this only shows that by using older data sets and just fusing them all together, 
we can replicate more modern results, um, which implies that if we actually committed to the effort of combining our data sets, we could get to some exciting results on detection faster than if we did this alone. Uh, so in the chat, Rahul asks, I might have missed it, but does the Hellings and Downs values vary with the type of gravitational wave signal? Yes, um, it can vary, but the gravitational wave signal that I'm talking about here that I'm, that I'm focused on is a stochastic background. So that Hellings and Downs curve is specific. It's a specific correlation signature corresponding to an isotropic stochastic gravitational wave background with only the GR plus and cross polarizations. You get a different type of curve if you have anisotropy in the gravitational wave sky. So if you have structure across the sky, you'll get small departures from that Hellings and Downs curve. Um, also, if you have additional polarization states beyond the GR modes, so say if you have scalar modes or vector modes, then you'll get very, very different correlation signatures. Um, but this is, this is also good because then we can search for those types of additional polarization states um, by knowing what those signatures are. So this is something that, that uh, we're doing as well. We're looking for additional polarization states and tests of gravity with pulsar time and arrays. Stephen? Yes? Uh, you mentioned a few slides before that uh, one maybe should go to uh, creating an adaptive uh, noise function for each of the pulsars. Like, uh, how, how would you approach that? And are, are there people working on that already? Or? There are people working on that. Um, so we, we're approaching it at the moment um, in all of the different PTAs, we're approaching it at the moment through Bayesian model selection. Essentially, we have three main uh, noise sectors that we care about. There's the white noise, there's the low frequency red noise, and then there's also radio frequency dependent noise as the pulses propagate to the ISM. So we look at each of those in turn and actually we mostly focus on the, the, the radio frequency dependent noise. There are lots of interesting features in there. Sometimes there is a gap in the interstellar medium, a void, and suddenly the, the dispersion measure of, uh, of that particular pulsar will drop suddenly. And then a few months later, it will come back so we have to take into account these transient features in the dispersive properties of the pulsar time series um, with, with um, additional modeling. Also, occasionally you'll get pulsars whose line of sight gets close to the sun. And so you get uh, signatures from the solar wind because that's, a, that's an ionized plasma and you get, uh, you get these spikes in the, in the dispersion, dispersion measure from when the pulsar line of sight gets close to the sun. All of those need to be taken into account for advanced noise modeling. We typically talk to our experts in our noise budget working groups who know about these things. We also talk with the, the dedicated pulsar timers in order for us to have some knowledge and some, some reasonable domain of models for us to test. Um, because you could imagine that we could just go down a rabbit hole of lots of different things to, to try. So we try to restrain ourselves and restrict ourselves to uh, physical noise models things that are well motivated. All right, I see Rahul has a question, go ahead. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, I figured I'd just ask this instead of typing it, but um, from what I understand, this uh, the, the Hellingson, uh, well, I called the HD, I forget what the difference was. Uh, Hellingson Hellings Dance. Yeah. Hellings Dance. You're right. Um, so HD values seem to, um, yeah, like you say, depend on the hypothesis of the gravitation wave. So this is all modeled for stochastic waves. Um, so do, and you mentioned that people are trying to, you know, figure out whether maybe, you know, the, the deviations could be explained by other polarizations. Um, but could it also be, I mean, is this something that's already being done at the, inside the PTA, where uh, you basically do a Bayesian analysis of different other hypotheses? Um, like, you know, maybe you just, this is, this is basically a, uh, a form of um, a combination of both stochastic waves, as well as maybe a merger that's going on and, you know, things like that. And, you know, you probably can figure out what kind of model best fits. Maybe it's a combination of both stochastic and some other kind of, uh, you know, 
but yeah, some other kind of source. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. Um, so we, we do expect that at, at, at some point we'll get to the stage where we've got um, a stochastic background plus these individual signals that are sticking up above the background and can be resolved. Um, so the way we do that is we have, we, I keep talking about this global model because you'll hear that terminology co used quite a lot in the LISA literature and LISA talks because you're having to search over all of the signals all of the time. Um, so that's that's what we need to do. And that's, that's something that's being uh, done at the moment is research. Uh, we have people looking at uh, searches that um, have a stochastic background signal plus an individual binary or several individual binaries that are trying to be searched for at the same time. Um, so your question is, is very valid. It's very timely. It's something we've got going on at the moment. Okay, now I've got a, a limited amount of time here and I'm gonna to try to fit in as much as I can, but I wanted to give you a view of the next, uh, the next years of pulsar time and array science. We decided to you know, look ahead, given the, the exciting results from the nanograph 12.5 year data, we decided to forecast what we might see uh, and when we might see it, if this were a gravitational wave signal. Um, so along the, the, the panels here, you're seeing a progression in time of data going from 12 years up to 15 years, up to 20 years. As we get up to 15 years and then 20 years, the significance of Helene's and Downing's correlations just skyrockets. So if this were an actual gravitational wave background signal in our data, at 12 years, it's not very significant, but at 15 and 20 years, we do see something. And the good news is we already have 15 years of data. We just have to go and analyze it. And this is work that was led by uh, Dr. Nihan Pohl, who's a, a postdoctoral fellow at Vanderbilt um, in my research group. We also have lots of other colleagues here that, 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 that contributed to this. Um, I can't list everyone, but uh, we, had, we had input from lots of members in Nanograph. Andrew, go ahead. Um, do you have a set threshold for the signal to noise ratio you would use for the cross correlation yet? Or are you just trying to get it to be as high as possible and then declare detection? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. We, you know, in, in LIGO, they, they attempted to get signal to noise greater than, greater than five because that dictates what your false alarm probability is. Um, for, for an SNR of three, of the cross correlations, the false alarm probability is about 0.1%. Um, we would take that as very, very strong evidence. So our internal calibrator of significance in PTAs is that we want to get significance. We want to get the SNR greater than three um, in the cross correlations. Now that's only in the cross correlations. In the actual measurement of the spectrum of this process, the significance would be through the roof. The base factor for the actual measurement of the spectrum would be in the hundreds of thousands. Um, but the cross correlations are much weaker and they take longer to accumulate. So we're just trying to get above signal to noise of three. Um, I'm not going to focus on this too much, but you know, in anticipation of the fact that we might have additional noise processes in the data set, we'd like to prove the multipolar structure of these cross correlations and to say once and for all whether they're actually Helens and Downs or something else, you know, as Rahul was mentioning, it could be additional things in there. Um, we could have not just Hellings and Downs, but some sort of flat monopolar signature. We could have a dipole shape in there. And we can do this by probing the, the actual pairwise correlation measurements and decomposing them on a Legendre series. This is very similar to what's done in cosmology. You take the two point correlations and you just decompose them onto, onto a spherical harmonic or a Legendre basis and look at the angular structure. For us, we're looking at the, the cross correlation structure and we're expecting that we'll see a quadrupolar excess. Remember from yesterday's lecture, the antenna response function for pulsar time and arrays is quadrupolar with a long tail to higher multipoles. That's what we're looking for. And what you're seeing here is sort of a projection of what we might see in the measurement of these multipoles uh, as we go into the future. And we know what this is analytically for the Hellings and Downs curve. Um, as we go on into the future, our constraints on the amplitude and the spectral index of the power law that's representing the strain spectrum of the background will improve as well. We have these scaling laws that tell you when we'll get to within a certain precision. 
Uh, we expect that first detection, the first claim detection of the stochastic background will come packaged with really informative parameter estimation constraints as well on the amplitude and spectral index. We'll get about 40% uncertainty on the amplitude and the spectral index. The amplitude tells you about a whole host of merger rate dependent factors of supermassive binary black holes. And then the spectral index indeed tells you whether this is supermassive binary black holes, because you want this to be close to minus two thirds for a binary population. Um, I didn't get into the derivation of that yesterday, but I can upload the derivation if, uh, if Alberto didn't cover it yesterday. You want this alpha here in the strain spectrum to be minus two thirds. If you have an additional origin of the gravitational waves, say those gravitational waves actually came from uh, the early universe rather than binaries, um, then you get a different uh, alpha, a different uh, spectral index. So arbitrating what this spectral index is will tell you what the origin is uh, of the gravitational waves. And so we'll have very interesting constraints on those uh, when we claim first detection. Okay, there is a whole host of other astrophysics we can do here. It's not just a power law strain spectral shape all the way down. As I mentioned before, if you can probe lower frequencies, then you're probing wider separations of the binaries. And at those wider separations, you might actually have the binaries interacting with their ambient astrophysical environment in the centers of the galaxy. And so you'll be able to infer different properties of the stars and gas that the binaries could be interacting with, and indeed whether the binaries have any residual eccentricity. Um, we can probe different polarization states of uh, gravitational waves. Um, I'm going to gloss over a lot of this, but you can read up after the, after the lecture. Um, a generic metric theory of gravity has actually six polarization states, whereas GR only permits two. And those two are the plus and the cross and they're, they're transverse, they're tensor transverse modes. But a metric theory of gravity can have scalar longitudinal, can have vector longitudinal modes. And those create very, very different correlation signatures than the Hellings and Darns curve. Um, so the fact that they're very different is great news because we should be able to separate them quite well from the Hellings and Darns curve. We're also looking at possible interpretations of these gravitational wave backgrounds as primordial gravitational waves. Um, so in the early universe, you have these quantum fluctuations in space time that are then amplified to cosmological scales by inflation. Uh, and that can produce a background of gravitational waves that we should be sensitive to. And not just pulsar time and arrays, but this is a broadband signal that LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA are searching for as well. And LISA will be sensitive to primordial gravitational waves. This is really a pan-spectral signature from the early universe that uh, all gravitational wave detectors are looking for. And pulsar timing arrays actually have some of the, the best limits so far. Um, if I just focus in this region here, the star shows the pulsar limit that we currently have, and that corresponds to recent pulsar timing results. Um, and then this is where um, advanced ground-based detectors will get to over here. LISA will get much, much deeper into possible inflationary scenarios. We're also looking at early universe processes corresponding to phase transitions in the early universe. Um, so as the universe cools, it'll undergo phase transitions where um, bubbles of the new vacuum solution will actually um, permeate through the universe. And then the bubbles of that new vacuum, the new phase of the universe will collide together and the collision of the bubble walls will create gravitational waves. And the instabilities created by the bubbles will source further gravitational waves. So this is just like when the universe, this is just like when other types of matter um, cool and undergo phase transitions. The universe is just transitioning from one phase to another. Um, now we probably can't probe grand unified theory phase transition scales, uh, but we could probe um, lower temperature dark sector phase transitions, dark sector transitions and dark sector particle physics are all the rage at the moment. Um, I'm not an expert, but if you're interested, then please see the, the recent nanograph search on this. Cosmic strings are another pretty cool prospect. Cosmic strings are essentially one dimensional topological defects formed in the early universe during 
those phase transitions. It's kind of like when ice melts and you get cracks forming. Um, those cracks are topological defects in space-time that permeate the entire Hubble volume. So they're essentially Hubble length, one dimensional strings. Um, and those strings can interact with each other. When they interact, they can chop off small loops from each other. And those small loops are in such high tension that they vibrate relativistically and emit gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves could be found by pulsar timing arrays and other gravitational wave detectors. Uh, so we can put constraints on the cosmic string tension and also the probability that they chop off small loops whenever they interact with each other. This is, I'm going over this very quickly, but hopefully giving some references here if you're interested. Okay, and we can also probe things like dark matter, whether it's some sort of axionic dark matter or cold dark matter substructure, all of these different effects will create measurable influences in our pulsar timing uh, observations. So lots of references here for you to dig into. Uh, ultralight scalar field dark matter or axionic dark matter is in vogue at the moment. People are very interested in it as a way of solving some, um, some problems with, with cosmological structure not quite matching what Lambda CDM predicts. Um, so pulsar timing could, uh, could probe those, those things as well. So I'll finish by saying that <clears throat> PTAs are on track to detect nanohertz gravitational waves in the next few years. And they're sensitive to the most massive compact objects in the universe. These are supermassive binary black holes. And if recent results from nanograv and the PPTA and other PTAs um, do, do um, uh, hold water, then detection and characterization of, of the cross correlations, which is the definitive marker of detection, will follow within the next few years. Uh, once we get beyond that, we'll start to be able to probe into some very interesting astrophysics of um, supermassive black holes, including their demographics and their dynamical properties. Um, we could, in fact, detect multi messenger supermassive black holes if we can find a counterpart. Um, we can also access some cosmological signatures as well, uh, which might lie below the level of the supermassive binary black hole background. So it's an exciting field. Things are heating up. And uh, if you're interested in this, uh, feel free to get in touch. Um, and I'll leave you with that. Thanks so much for your attention. Yeah, so that's a that's a really good point. Um, so I'll just go back to show where this this all uh, comes in. So the, the the dependence of the mass, the chirp mass distribution, and the the number density is kind of all encapsulated into one variable, which is the overall amplitude of the background. Hence, why it's it is so difficult to tease those apart. Um, now, it is possible that we could we could uh, tease it apart using some information from the lower frequencies because the chirp mass distribution will have some effect on, on the coupling of, um, of, of, the, of the black holes to stars and gas, and also whether there's some eccentricity there. So hopefully this spectrum is not a power law all the way down. Hopefully there's some information at lower frequencies, which could actually break the degeneracy between some of the factors that are wrapped up in the amplitude. Uh, otherwise, we'll need we'll need an external messenger. Um, you know, it, it's possible that we could use the distribution of massive black hole masses that come from direct observations, um, or you know, if if some of these binary AGN candidates are are actually true binaries and not false positives, then the distribution of those properties determined with the Rubin Observatory might be important information to help calibrate what might the, what the chirp mass distribution might be. But it's, it's going to be a tough problem to disentangle these different effects. 
we can only hope that we've got some sort of turnover in the spectrum or more uh, exciting features than just a power law all the way done. So turnover, um, just a really quick follow-up. So you have to have a turnover though, right? Because otherwise you run into the kind of project problem. Um, right. Um, I mean, yes, we have to have some turnover at some point. We don't know when it is though. Um, so if it's in the band of PTAs, so if it's within, you know, human time scales of 30 years, 30 years is, is one nanohertz, um, that would be great. So if we can infer a turnover before we get to 30 years of observations, then perfect, we can start doing some disaster physics and constrain some of these processes. But it, it could easily just be below that as well, in which case it's going to be more difficult for us to tease that out because it'll take much longer. Uh, uh, can you go back maybe to the picture where you show the power spectrum result uh, for the other experiment, the, maybe the European PTA or the Australian one? Uh, this one? Yeah, this one. Why in the uh, right picture, the bottom of the uncertainty bars uh, is flat, like it has a cutout at uh, minus 11 or something like that? Oh, you mean like it stops here? Yeah, it's like a... Yeah, that's that's the lower sampling limit of the prior. That's There's nothing significant to that, except that um, we had to choose a reasonable low value in our prior distribution of these, uh, of these uh, power values. And minus 11 is below what we could actually detect. So it's a reasonable value. Okay, I see. I mean, I th I, what I thought you were going to ask, and so what I'll point out is the positions of, uh, of the planet orbital periods on this plot. And that, that's relevant for this solar system ephemeris problem. So you can kind of see why Jupiter uh, might be one of the things that would cause systematic uncertainties for us, because it has an orbital period of about 12.9 years, um, which is very, very close to our, the length of our data sets. And then Saturn is going to be the next big problem because it has an orbital period of 30 years. Okay, thank you. Steve, I think it was brought up yesterday, the idea of a single source. Mm -hmm. uh, that creating as the background in these first looks. I don't know if we exactly talked about that, but I heard something um, along those lines. Just, maybe this is something you should know from yesterday's derivation, but if you just have a single source, what does the analog of the Helling bounds curve look like? Does it look the same? Yeah, yeah, it's so that's a that's a fun calculation to do. It was actually pointed out by uh, Neil Cornish and Alberto Susana in 2013. Um, if you if you just had a single source in your data and you you correlated the data together and looked at what the correlation structure was over angular separation, you would see something that's very, very close to the Hellings and Downs curve. And that's because there's a symmetry in, there's a symmetry in the problem. Um, if you have one gravitational wave source and lots of pulsars, and then you just average over lots of pulsar pairs in a bin, you'll get the Hellings and Downs curve. Because instead of integrating over many gravitational wave sources, you're kind of integrating over pulsar pairs. Now, the usual derivation of the Hellings and Downs curve is that you have lots of gravitational wave sources and one pulsar pair. So there's, a, there's kind of a symmetry in the problem. It's possible that we could get something that looks, at least to the naked eye, like the Hellings and Downs curve from one source. However, that would be a monochromatic signal. And so in frequency space, it would just look like a single frequency spike. Um, but what we're seeing is something that's more like um, an extended power law distribution. Um, you know, is, is it possible that we're, we've just measured like five single sources here? Maybe, um, but they, they happen to, go ahead. What do you expect the width of that delta function in frequency space to be, right? So that could be spread out depending on the Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I, so, it could be spread out. I don't think it would be spread out over multiple frequencies. Um, it would have to be 
you know, another thing is if we had a if we had an eccentric source, then yes, its power is spread out over multiple harmonics of the orbital frequency, and so you get some distribution across frequency bins. But this would have to be super, uh, a super eccentric binary or a sequence of super eccentric binaries. And at some, so at some point, you just invoke Occam's razor and say it's more likely to be a stochastic background than it is uh, sort of a conspiracy of eccentric binaries. Well, the more conspiracies you have, the more simple this Right, that's true. All right. Well, is there any, any other questions on Zoom? One. Does the luminosity of the pulsar vary in correlation with uh, the Z value, the redshift value that you arrived yesterday for the pulsar? No, not by any measurable amount. Um, no, the, the the luminosity properties of the pulsar itself don't don't change. It's it's only a minor, it's only a tiny you know hundred nanosecond deviation to the timing properties, not uh, not to the optical properties or the the observed properties. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think Andrew Andrew has a question. Uh, yeah, another question actually about the timing. Is there any reason you don't use, say, GPS as like a net global standard time to, for your like ground based detection? Or uh, there's, there's no reason. I think GPS is actually built into this as well. Um, I, I didn't mention it, but I, I, I believe GPS is built in as part of the kind of global time standard in addition to the national atomic clock standards. Mm -hmm. Hey, Steve, thanks so much again. Uh, thanks for joining us. And thanks for all the great information about Pulse Our Time. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone.